Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, key lawmakers weigh in on advances in nuclear power generation and the need for a paid family and medical leave program. Plus, the governor signs into law a bill that makes Minnesota a leader in ALS research. I don't get it. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. Proponents of nuclear energy are saying that nuclear power is key to a clean, reliable, and affordable energy supply. Senator David Senjim is chair of the Energy and Utilities Committee, and he joins me to talk about nuclear energy and other proposals to expand affordable, carbon-free energy. Thanks for being here. Good to be here. It's Always nice good. To, yeah, it's great to see you. <laughs> 11 states now have policies in support of advanced nuclear energy, and your committee has spent the last few weeks delving into advanced nuclear energy technologies. In your view, is this a direction that Minnesota should go? Well, I think it's, it's certainly a, an option, and we always talk about the menu. So, and, and what we're talking about now is not giant nuclear power plants or anything like that. We're talking about s much smaller units that, uh, that might be appropriate for a city, depending on the size and so on and so forth. So, so I think you have to have it in the menu, and, uh, and right now we have a moratorium in Minnesota. Uh, the utilities really, I mean, because of that moratorium, they, 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 they can't even, I mean, they can think about it, but they really can't go forward with it, and they're not going to spend any money uh, even evaluating it at this point, given given the moratorium. So, so we'd like to lift that moratorium so some of these ideas can kind of fulminate a little bit. Doesn't mean we do them or not, but uh, but it's certainly an option. To your question, it's certainly an option that we ought to look at. Well, in lifting that moratorium, there there are bills that that would do that. There's also some resistance usually based on on waste and what happens to the waste. Now, one of the testifiers did say that a key to the waste issue is educating the public. Uh, do you agree that if the public were more educated on what nuclear waste is and, and the safety of it and all of that, that that would help move the needle? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, the waste is the waste, uh, but we, we have technology, we have these dry cast uh, devices, containers uh, in Prairie Island, frankly, and, and Monticello right now, which are securely holding it. They uh, will literally take uh, uh, a, a lot of force should that ever happen. It probably won't, but uh, but they're 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 very very sturdy. They're very very able to contain these uh, these materials and 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 the radiation within them. So literally, they're 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 tubes, standing tubes on a concrete uh, uh, slab, and and you can you can see them and you can frankly touch them if you want to, I guess. And uh, <laughs> and so and and they're monitored 24 hours, you know, literally 24 hours a day. So. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I believe that that's pretty safe. I mean, if, you know, you have to look at the physics of all this, and uh, certainly that's been done uh, repeatedly. Yeah, this is this is this is safe, but people just don't understand this from the standpoint of, of nuclear power, atom bombs, et cetera, et cetera. It's 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 all that kind of feeds into this. But I do wish uh, that people could go down to Prairie Island and uh, see some of this, and or Monticello, and because I think they'd feel somewhat relieved uh, about how we're handling them. Now, your committee had presentations about what they're calling advanced nuclear technology. And so you're talking about what Minnesota has to, you know, traditional, very large scale nuclear power plants. However, some of these new technologies offer a variety in fuel sources, innovations in sa safety systems, and also completely different scale from these very large, you know, what we traditionally think of. Are we, is, is this new emerging technology, I think someone in the committee said it's a very exciting time. Is it an exciting time? Are we on the cusp of a kind of nuclear renaissance? Well, I think so because th this world right now is certainly looking for inter energy independence, uh, you know, getting off oil and things like that, uh, more, more than maybe ever in, in my lifetime. Uh, and, and so we're also looking for clean, reliable energy. And so, and certainly affordable, but but so what's on the menu? It's uh, you know we certainly have wind, solar, uh, the the hydrogen revolution is coming. We know that from the standpoint of a storage media and and frankly fuel, and and that's clean and that's good. Uh, but but we I don't think we can forget nuclear power either because it it, it does provide uh, that clean and reliable power that uh, we all want. Uh, we want the lights on. We want the cameras on. 
and and we need that. And so this is this is uh, certainly an option. It's it, it's a little more expensive, maybe in the short term, uh, but uh, these these things last uh, you know a long time, and so they can be kept going and uh, in a safe, reliable way, and more safe than ever, frankly, as we point it was as we learned in, in in the hearing. So yeah, you can't you can't forego these. I don't think at all. I mean, we, we don't complain too much about, uh, you know, aircraft carriers. We don't complain too much about nuclear submarines. Uh, but the big power plant is, is just one of those things that people uh, almost uh, in an ingrained way uh, uh, sort of are fearful of. I'd like to shift away from nuclear power right now because you have two bills that, that I'd like to talk about that would um, uh, perhaps lower energy costs. Um, outside of the nuclear question, um, you're proposing a bill that would create a process by which the Public Utilities Commission would allow natural gas utilities to sell bonds as a way of reducing the economic impact on customers after extraordinary events. So I assume we're talking about an event like the polar vortex in Texas last year. How does the bond sale help alleviate that price spike that we saw here? Well, let's just say, for instance, the Texas incident, uh, you know, the gas companies in the middle of the winter, they still obviously needed to serve customers. Uh, their price of gas went way up uh, and, and almost to the point of unaffordable for the gas company itself, but they had to buy it at extraordinary prices. Now, what do they do with, with, with this uh, situation they're in? They, they have to pass it on to the rate payers, and that's what we're experiencing right now. Uh, and and, and, and you know, they might be able to borrow a little bit short term. This would allow the gas companies uh, to be able to buy bonds, perhaps 20 year bonds at a very, very low interest rate, uh, AAA bonds, and, and then effectively uh, sort of level that payment off so that uh, it's much more incremental over a long period of time and, and much less notice than we're noticing right now. So it's, it's a tool, if you will, as it was described in the toolbox, it may or may not be used. If it is used, it's going to be used with the Public Utilities Commission, a lot of scrutiny, a lot of oversight, and so on. But, uh, but we thought, uh, it was certainly in the committee, that was a good thing to advance. Uh, and I, I, I dare say it's probably going to go through our bill, and, and the House, I think, was going to agree, and, and we'll have this in, in law. And, and so we'll be able to level those spikes off. That's, that's what this thing does. It levels the spikes off a little easier on consumers, and frankly, saves a lot of money in the long term for consumers. It would certainly be appreciated for those of us who saw much higher energy prices than, than we are accustomed to. Um, you're also author of a proposal that would allot $10 million in one-time funding for an energy storage incentive program. So the proposal would allow electric utilities to provide grants to customers for the installation of energy storage systems. So if this became law, would my electricity provider potentially offer me a grant and maybe how much to put solar panels on my roof? Yeah, the uh, the answer is is yes. The, well, depending, on, you have to be an XL customer. Okay. <laughs> so okay, that's for, for starters, because okay. this uh, the ability to do this financially comes out of what we call the renewable development account, and that's uh, exclusive to the XL service territory in Minnesota. But uh, if that were the case, the answer is yes, uh, you would be eligible, and uh, and more and more people certainly are are installing solar panels on their roof. Uh, they do sell the excess electricity back to the utility. Uh, but this would allow for those that want to uh, an ability to store it within, within their battery, typically located in their basement or wherever it might be, and uh, be able to live off that battery uh, inc incrementally as, uh, as the peaks and valleys of, of the day go by and, uh, in terms of energy usage in your house. So, so it's an attractive option and we'll see how it goes, but it's brand new at least in terms of a, of a thought here and uh, we're going to try it. Senator David Senjum, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Always fun. Thank you. This week, the Senate granted its full support to a bill that divests state pension funds from Russia and Belarus and codifies the governor's executive order blocking state contracts with Russian entities. This bill, while small, is an action that the Minnesota legislature can take to stop Putin and his army from further atrocities in the Ukraine. Atrocities that we have not seen here since World War II and they threaten to destroy a peaceful nation that poses absolutely no threat to Russia, Belarus, or any of its neighbors. 
There are over 17,000 Ukrainians living in Minnesota, and we've heard from many of them since this bill was introduced, one being Luda Anastasievsky, a woman who was born in Maripol, Ukraine, a local, and she's a local leader here in Minnesota, and she's a member of the Ukraine community, and she's been an educator in Minnesota for 30 years. She has not spoken to anyone in her family in over a month. She doesn't know how they're doing, even if they're alive. All communication to the Ukraine has been cut off. Her hometown of Maripol is now in its fifth week of heavy shelling, and over 80% of residential housing has been destroyed. For those that remain, the conditions are brutal. They have no electricity, and food and water is scarce. The global community has stepped up to condemn these actions by targeting the Russian economy. Minnesota can join them by responsibly divesting our state agencies and state pension from Putin's war machine. Pension holders do not want to fund their retirement from the bloodshed, and we do not want state agencies to serve them while holding contracts in Russia and Belarus. I grew up with, and I proudly represent, a strong, vibrant Ukrainian-American community. Like many communities, they value their cultural tradition. They cherish the music, the food, the dancing. And for the Ukrainians, the decorative Easter eggs. Oris Kramarchuk recently wrote in the Star Tribune about his family, Ukraine, and Russia. He wrote about how this war is rooted in Russia's displacing and destroying Ukraine and their culture. How do we help the people of Ukraine save their culture, save their soul, save their democracy? We can help by voting green. This bill sends a message that we can work together, that we support the sovereign, democratic nation of Ukraine in a measured way that works for the State Board of Investment. Please vote green to oppose Putin, to oppose this war, to oppose the genocide. Please vote green to stand with Ukraine and our Ukrainian Minnesotans. Please vote green for freedom and democracy. Slava Ukraini. And Governor Walls signed into law a bill authored by Senator David Tomasoni, who is suffering from the neurodegenerative disease, ALS, that will provide $20 million for research and $5 million to support caregivers. Minnesota's advocates around uh, the, uh, the treatment, the care, and the eventual curing of ALS has, uh, has been uh, front and center. Today takes that to an entirely different level. You see a bipartisan wide net that was cast to try and attack this issue in a way that hasn't been done in any state before. And I'm just incredibly proud to watch what's happened here. This piece of legislation is here to be signed. Um, one of the first things that's been there, and it shows Minnesotans that um, we can come together around a common good. You know, the governor called me shortly after my diagnosis told me that he would support whatever I wanted. I received similar assurances from Speaker Hortman and Majority Leader Miller. Maybe I should have asked for more. <laughs> such assurances I never would have expected to be here. Signing this particular bill, participating in a signing ceremony of this magnitude, surrounded by so much love and friendship, this early in the legislative session. My family and I are overwhelmed and grateful to everyone involved. I will never forget the day, last June, when David came into our suite up on the third floor here, and he had been doctoring on Fridays. And he came in on Monday morning and I immediately went into his office and I said, David, what did you find out at the doctor Friday? And he had a hard time getting the words and he said, I've got ALS. And I said, well, David, what's, what's the prognosis? And he said, Tom, they told me there's nothing they can do. So my hope, and I know David's hope for the bill is, is that someday somebody's friend or family member is going to be able to come home after a diagnosis and say, there's something they might be able to do.
We're here today because uh, Senator Tomasoni looked adversity in the face, and he took this moment and he used himself to help so many others. And he is uh, a, a true friend of mine, and uh, he took me underneath his, uh, his wing, and he showed me that it wasn't about Democrat or Republican, it was about your district and it was about people. And if there's one thing that anyone can learn from Senator Tomasoni, love solves everything and hate solves nothing. Together, we look forward to seeing continued advances in research led by the great state of Minnesota, to see meaningful treatments come to market, and to realize a world without ALS. According to a January report by the Bipartisan Policy Center, nine states and the District of Columbia have enacted paid family leave programs. A paid family and medical leave program in Minnesota has been a goal of Senator Susan Kent for several years now, and she joins me to talk more about it. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to see you, Shane. The Minnesota Senate passed paid family medical leave back in 2016, but the House did not take it up. I spoke with you about the bill again in 2019, so here we are, another three <laughs> years later, it seemed time to revisit this. Why do Minnesotans need a paid family medical leave benefit? I think you can ask any Minnesotan that question and they'll give you a good answer, and there are a lot of them. If they uh, have a baby and they need time off from work, um, we know that about 25% to 33% of mothers who give birth have to go back to work within two weeks of giving birth. Nobody chooses to go back to work two weeks of giving birth. And this is the only way we're really gonna get at that. Um, if you have a serious illness, like, and you need ser you know, serious cancer treatments, say for example, that sideline you, or you have a serious injury, or you have an ailing elderly parent and you need to be there for them and to care for them. Any of these are just some examples of why Minnesotans need this benefit. As I mentioned in the introduction, there's a growing list of states that are adopting some kind of paid family leave benefit, and each state operates differently. What, in general, are the st startup costs likely to be? How long until it's fully functional? If it would become law, how long until we achieve, you know, sort of a regular benefit that people could take advantage of? If we were, there, and there have been several different proposals, and my bill has not had a hearing, so we've not been able to really debate and discuss and amend to address some of these questions, but, because uh, that's the purpose of giving bills hearings, so that they can, we can do that public process, but, um, one of the proposals is that it would that people would pay into the fund for two years and then it would be fully operational. There are other options. For example, it's been proposed we could use some of this surplus money, one-time surplus money, to just get it started, and we it would take some time to get it literally implemented and up and running. But you know, pretty quickly, maybe a year, we could have people taking advantage of this. In essence, the state would be creating an insurance plan that all employees would pay into and that then anyone could dip into for a qualifying event. As you said, the birth of a child or the adoption of a child or caring for a seriously ill loved one um, and still get paid. What level of wage replacement are we talking about? It depends, it's on a sliding scale. So that it's up to 90% if you are at the low end of the pay scale, so you get almost all of your um, uh, payroll, your, your income taken care of, covered by this benefit. And if you make more money, it's down to, I think, 45 or 55 percent, and then it caps. So even if you make a lot of, if you have a really big salary, you're not going to get 45 or 50 percent of it. It's designed to support the, those who really need it the most, who cannot afford to take that time off, um, either for themselves who, in a major illness or injury, um, or for a loved one. And, you know, we just, we know that people need to not be put in the position of having to choose that kind of care or you know paying the rent paying putting food on the table now you mentioned that people who go back to work right after giving birth and and so I always wonder about people who are part-time because when I had my children uh, I was an adjunct faculty member and so I was not a full-time employee I didn't have those kinds of benefits I ended up taking a week for each child 
Would part-time workers be eligible for maybe a prorated amount? Yes, and it is structured to work so that part-time workers have the opportunity as well. And as I had my baby when I was self-employed, and self-employed people can opt into it. And they same thing, they can pay into it and then they can um, potentially pay somebody to keep doing the work while they're taking the time off. Uh, some of the larger businesses in Minnesota are already self-funding this benefit for their own employees. And, and with a tight labor market, you know, that is certainly an attraction for employees and, and creating maybe an unlevel playing field then. For those companies that already have this, would your bill preempt their plans? What the bill does is it says that if you as an employer, any size, are offering a benefit that meets the standards, the same standards that the state plan would be, you can keep yours. Or if yours is a little short, you can just upgrade yours um, and, and meet those same standards. But it does say that every Minnesotan would qualify in their workplace to, to have access to this benefit and get and have the option of leave when they need it for as long as they need it up to 12 weeks um, uh, it, so that so that they don't have to make that difficult choice. As you know, Republican Senator Julia Coleman has proposed a measure that would allow businesses, especially small ones who can't compete with these larger companies, uh, to purchase insurance products on behalf of their employees as a way to expand that benefit to more Minnesotans. Could you support this knowing that it is at least moving the needle forward for more Minnesotans? First of all, I'm really glad to see that there is bipartisan um, efforts to try to solve this very real need for Minnesotans. My concerns with these proposals is the way they are, first of all, when you, um, the, the proposals don't cover everybody. They, um, uh, both in terms of they don't have the medical leave part of this, this is only a family leave plan. If you have pregnancy complications, it doesn't count. Um, then it's more expensive because anytime you go through the private in, in insurance industry, it just is a more expensive because you've got a smaller pool. The larger pool of a statewide plan is what brings the cost down for everybody across the board. And then, uh, which makes it feasible to, to, to make everybody receive, able to receive the benefit. And then the other problem with this one is that it is capped there's just you know if the state were to subsidize this for everybody in the at, at, through this type of a mechanism we couldn't afford to do it so it'll be relatively few people who um, who have access to it we just there's the math just doesn't work to make it widely available um, and uh, and it doesn't prohibit a company like for example a major corporation as we've seen they will sometimes provide benefits to people in headquarters corporate headquarters but not for folks who are working say in the in the in the restaurant outlets or in the retail outlets this would this that would still allow allow those kinds of um, picking and choosing to happen. Now, the one criticism, though, that I have heard from some Republicans is that this proposal uh, is sort of a one-size-fits-all approach and um, creates, potentially creates another Minlars because it would be a state-run program. How do you counter that? One of the things I would say is the way that ours is developed. First of all, we have been learning from states that have been doing it. The state of Washington, for example, has a very similar unemployment insurance system that Minnesota has. And so we can model our uh, paid family medical leave program off our unemployment insurance system and also off, for, off the program that Washington State has very successfully implemented. So we don't have to have whole new computer systems. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. It takes advantage of all the great learning of w what we know works and what we know worked through the pandemic. Let's be clear, these states got to kick the tires on their plans and their, pro and, and their policies through a historic time and it worked. And so, you know, we feel like that's a that's pretty good testimonial for what that could do for Minnesotans. Now, one more thing before we go, because uh, you were elected to the Senate in 2012 and you served as leader of the DFL caucus from early 2020 until last September when you announced that you were going to retire and you stepped down from your leadership role. What over this decade are you most proud of? That is such a hard question because there's so much. Um, I'm really proud of uh, what uh, we've been able to do really with DFL leadership, um, both in the governor's office and in the legislature at different points in terms of bringing our budget back from a crisis, not having the um, ongoing surplus uh, deficits, which means we're constantly having to cut for schools and our public safety and judiciary and communities. Um, I would also point to, um, I will never forget voting for same-sex marriage. 
and what that meant for so many people. And, um, and the last one I will say is uh, being able to support uh, student mental health and counselors, uh, school psychologists and social workers. We made a, a dent in that, but as we know right now more than ever, we need to keep doing that. Senator Susan Kent, thank you so much. Thank you. The Civil Law and Data Practices Committee grappled with the details of a bill that would prohibit social media companies from using algorithms that specifically target children. Algorithms are not seen. They're hard to understand. They're not tangible. But they are much as much of a danger to our children and even more insidious because they're not well understood. So this simply is an attempt to protect kids from things just as harmful as tobacco and alcohol and everything else. What does this legislation ultimately do? It makes it harder to be a parent because it removes core tools for parents and allows the retention of lawful but awful content. So let me give you a couple of examples. It's an exceptionally well-intentioned bill. I totally understand why the sponsor is doing this and I respect it. But the unintended consequences include, for example, my son loves reading on his Kindle. And when he finishes his book, guess what? It's able to recommend the next book in the series or something very similar to what they might be interested in, outlawed under this bill. Nearly 20% of these young children are using social media daily. We've known for years that social media platforms, especially image-based platforms like Instagram, can have very harmful effects on teen mental health particularly for teens struggling with body image, anxiety, depression, and eating disorders. Understand that over the past year, there has been numerous stories written in national media that blame algorithms for choosing negative content to display to kids and teens. But if I leave you at one point, it's that algorithms are also the very same tools that help services target good content towards kids and teens. As a parent, I share that concern. I've got a 14-year-old who's on social media all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, we try to keep track of what she watches, but we can't do a great job of it unless we're just sitting over her shoulder all the time. I tend to lean toward uh, uh, advancing the cause of the First Amendment, even when I don't like what the First Amendment might allow to be spoken or communicated. Because we've heard what we heard tonight for a long time previous to this. Yes, we understand there are issues. Yes, we want to work together. Yes, we take protection very seriously. But those all sound like just words and platitudes when there's not the actions to back it up. And I don't know, short of passing this bill out, what can motivate you to actually take actions. What's right here is to stop this and to send them a message. As you said, Mr. Chair, Send them a message. The people in the state of Minnesota will protect their kids against this evil, invisible chunk that they put out. They do it to make money. Your kids are being harmed because they want to make money. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.